Hello, my name is Angela Reem, and this is my presentation of the collaboration between me and FAR. This is going to focus on human trafficking. Uh, I wanted to start off the paper with a very impactful quote. Um, the universal law of supply and demand. If there is no demand, there would be no supply. Uh, I found the demand part portion of human trafficking um, where I want to study the most, the most important. Uh, Far also believes it is extremely important, but he also wants to focus on sex tourism specifically. So he will be explaining that portion of the presentation and I will be sticking mostly towards the uh, demand. So <clears throat> I had a few um, very important myths I want to explain first because uh, they're, they're dangerous actually. Uh, a few myths that are um, important that need clarification are that most sex traffickers use violence when in truth they use psychological methods. Um, most traffickers target victims they don't know, which unfortunately, uh, more often than not, they target family, friends, and acquaintances. Sex trafficking involves movement or transportation. That's actually not true. You can be trafficked in your own neighborhood, in your own home, in your own town, in your own city, in your own state, without transportation. Trafficked females will come forward and self-identify. Actually, that is extremely untrue. If um, 50% or more women will actually come in contact with authority or come in contact with someone they could um, divulge what's going on and they won't. It's very, very, um, very uncommon for one to come out and self-identify on their own. Um, Johns and traffickers, uh, another myth is that Johns and traffickers are sleazy, poor, ugly, or gross, that they are um, pimped out um, if you were to use the stereotype of what a pimp looks like on TV. Um, and unfortunately, this is not true either. They are not easy to spot. Uh, traffickers can be everything from a professional to a teacher to a priest. They could be young, they can be old, they could be wealthy or poor. They could be any and all races, they could be any and all religions, they could be male or they could be female. So, long story short, traffickers can be absolutely anyone. Uh, traffickers and Johns. Um, I also found some really staggering facts that I'd like to share with you. Uh, there are 27 million slaves in the world today. That's actually more than the Atlantic slave trade. 80% um, of them are female and 50% of them are children. Another thing I thought was extremely important to notice is that the average age of entry into sex trafficking for girls is 12 to 14 and for boys it's 11 to 13. So you're in not you're barely in junior high or not in junior high imagine you can think back where you were do you have a little sister little brother niece or a nephew and think about right now if they were to get grabbed or taken or persuaded or coerced um what it might be like at that moment uh that to me is just is unbelievable uh so there's two major demands for sex trafficking. Um, one is the consumption of pornography. A lot of adult stars are forced into pornography and then also um, once a John or a gentleman has consumed enough pornography he might get the guts to take the next step forward which is the purchasing of sex from any individual. Here's a quote from Bells that I thought was very interesting. As long as people are sold like commodity for sexual services and buyers continue to frequent ads, um, advertisements for pornography and for people, the demand for human beings will continue. So one question I, co I constantly come up with is why? Um, why is this happening? Uh, and there is a slew of reasons. I actually found this in the National Institute for Justice report of the 2012. Uh, and these are some of the reasons why people purchase other people for um, sexual exploitation. Um, to engage in sex acts that few other women are, are willing to engage in. To experience sex with women in various, a variety of physical traits. To satisfy a desire for sex or intimacy that they are unable to meet in other ways. 
to satisfy a need for emotional support that they are not receiving from others, to provide them with sexual sex that requires little or no emotional involvement, because they are attracted to the excitement of the illicit nature of prostitution, because they have a difficult meeting women conventionally, because they feel that most women find them unattractive, because they don't have the time or desire the responsibility for a conventional relationship, because it provides less risky means of mimicking, ex um, of mimicking extreme fantasies. Uh, it's more likely you can uh, experience a rape scenario with a prostitute versus your wife. Um, and because they desire to be in control or dominant of women. So those ones I found specifically in the um, National Institute. A lot of those, I mean, these are people that just can't find a date or people that want to experience things they, they can't normally experience. Um, these ones right here, I kind of collected myself. I thought these were really, really important because uh, it leads into my next portion. Um, uh, so Johns have a skewed concept of helping um, economically. Some of them feel that they are honestly helping out the less fortunate in other countries or even at home, you know, at here. Well, she needs my money. She's on the street. Um, also, social and cultural pressures. So what I mean by this is um, welcoming a boy to manhood. Uh, a parent will actually take their son somewhere and say, okay, you're a man now. Let's go get you a prostitute. Um, and also men approving their masculinity. Uh, a lot of men that might not, that, um, <clears throat> that might feel a lot of pressure from other men. Hey, did you get some? Hey, you know, we're going to Vegas. You, you need to, you need to prove that you're a man, uh, something to that effect. Um, here are some really, really, um, f infamous, famous cliches that I'm sure if you haven't heard by now, you're going to hear. And all of these kind of normalize sex trafficking or normalize explo exploitation, explo exploitation. Uh, one is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So cl clearly the assumption is drugs or sex. And if it happens there, it stays there. Uh, so that normalizes it. Also come see the donkey show in Mexico. If you haven't heard of that, that's extremely depressing. Um, foot massages by Asians with happy endings, you kind of always assume that's uh, out there. Um, there's also this phrase, I'm going to try not to say it to where it's funny um, because it's normally, uh, oh me so horny me love you long time. Uh, that I've heard in multiple movies, I've heard in songs, I kind of heard all over and it's insinuating that the Asian culture is wanting this um, constantly, and it's going to last a long time. Um, also, it's the longest known profession, so it can't be wrong. It's an excuse. And another thing that I found that uh, kind of took me off guard, because I've done this, um, is the use of the word pimp when referring to like um, a good-looking man, or your son, oh, my son's pimped out, or pimp my ride, or um, my, doesn't my kid look pimp right now? Uh, I know it, at first, you, you don't think much of it, but you're really saying my son looks like he uh, dresses like he takes advantage of women, exploits women, um, and and makes them have sex with people. Is that is that do we want our children to look pimped out or our car to look pimped out? I think that term gets pushed around, and it, I know it's changed its meaning, but it's normalizing the profession. It's normalizing the word, and um, I feel kind of strongly about that. So the next section is where Farr introduced sex tourism. So I'm not going to go too far into that because he, that was his kind of uh, expertise. That's what he's, he felt passionate about. I do have a um, couple of personal stories that I will tell you about in a little bit. Um, so there are a lot of people, if you keep reading uh, um, the, pre the, the paper I wrote, there are a lot of individuals trying to combat the sex exploitation industry. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why it's very difficult. Um, uh, we learned in class that if a <clears throat> pimp got caught with a female in the car, he could very easily say, oh, it's my sister, it's my, you know, my niece, or something that affects. So it's very hard to actually even catch them, even if you catch them in the act. Um, also, it's a million dollar industry. It's growing. The, the product can be reusable over and over. 
uh, which I don't like, I'm, I don't want to use that term, but in this situation, you can see how, um, unfortunately, that's how they're being used. Uh, human beings are being used as just product that can be repeatedly used and you can find new product all the time. And so even if you do catch one, that pimp out there has, you know, the opportunity to change a hundred different females' lives or males' lives at, a, at any given minute. So there are some deterrents. Um, now this is, this is what I was talking about of how to reduce the demand. Um, there are, uh, Unfortunately, <laughs> these are just a few ideas, and these ideas have been used, but it's it's difficult to, to stop. So they have John schools where once the John gets caught, they go and get educated. Um, safe houses for Johns for confession and therapy. So places where if uh, John feels like this is something he wants to do before he actually acts on it, or if he's already acted on it, he can actually go to a safe home or a safe place um, where he can confess without being criminalized. Uh, maybe get some therapy there. Um, reverse stings, so obviously females and males, are, you know, um, undercover cops. Uh, decriminalizing the sale of sex while criminalizing the purchaser. So put the whole weight of the crime on the purchaser, not the seller. In most situations, the seller, um, it, it's not in, um, really up to her. She's being forced. Uh, we also have um, arrest and shaming Johns. So shaming Johns is kind of one thing that's been proven to be pretty popular. This is a part of Megan's Law, where um, law enforcement and the Johns, uh, anybody that's been convicted, has to publicly announce, go door to door, say, hey, I live next door, and I'm a sex offender. Um, there's also Dear John letters, and um, these letters and pamphlets and sexually transmitted diseases, you can flood the person that got caught with just, you know, pamphlets and letters um, talking about what it is that they were involved in, kind of try to embarrass them. Uh, maybe their wife or their kids or their family doesn't know, and they see the mail and like, oh, dad, what is this? Or, you know, whoever, brother, whoever it happened to be. So that's um, shaming. Okay, so there's also um, publicizing their identities. So making sure that that's, very, that's kind of along uh, Megan's law. Um, they're seizing the automobiles and driver's licenses, suspending driver's licenses, um, more public awareness and education campaigns, campaigns, uh, surveillance of popular self-trafficking uh, areas. There's also um, chemical castration, which is an option, longer prison sentences, loss of the option of public jobs around children. So once you get caught, you can no longer have any kind of job where you're around children in any way whatsoever. Um, and then I just have a, a, a more educated definition of Megan's Law there for you to look at if you're more interested in what exactly that was. So that's the majority of the presentation. Um, I said I had some personal experiences. I know I've mentioned a couple times about my, my girlfriend April who um, she told me that she was dating a gentleman and it she didn't even know that she was being trafficked at the time. She thought she was just doing some new adventurous things and uh, then finally realized once the boyfriend was no longer involved and then things started getting out of hand that that is what had happened and that had happened over a very, very short amount of time. It was only a couple of months. Um, also, I lived in Vegas for a very long time. And uh, if you're not a prostitute yourself, you know one or two or a handful. I worked in the bar industry. I actually knew quite a few. And regularly, I got asked by friends or family or people coming to visit Vegas or just guys at the bar that were ordering drinks, hey, do you know, do you know anyone? I want to have a good time. Do you know any professionals? And unfortunately, I did. And I passed along the information and I said, yeah, what are you looking for? I've even, you want a blonde or brunette? Um, unfortunately, I was not as educated as I am today. I don't know if all those girls that are like, hey, give my number out. I don't know their, their personal lives. I don't know if they were being forced into it. I don't know if they were out of options. I don't know if they were doing it for uh, drug reasons. All I know is that I directly participated and um, I, I feel awful for it. Um, also, Far and I were talking and we're two complete strangers up until this project and he lives near Mexico and he regularly got asked, hey, let's go to Mexico and 
go have some experiences or do you know anybody? And so I don't know how many of you have been asked questions like that. Um, or, hey, my friend's single and just really needs a good time. That was something that always, always came up when I lived in Vegas. Uh, also, even more recently, um, a neighbor of mine came up and said how excited he was that the COVID restrictions are starting to loosen up in Thailand because he's going to take a month-long trip and just participate in sex tourism the entire time. And when I looked at him and I was like, you have to be kidding me. You just were over here with your two-year-old niece, little girl, and you're going to go to Thailand on a sex adventure. And his immediate reaction was, listen, I have a lot of money and I don't want it to be complicated, so I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna stimulate their economy. They need my help. Uh, this this man um, really let me down. I couldn't, I could not believe what I was hearing. And so, like I said, I um, and we all, you know, any of you, if you are, yeah, let's go to Vegas and see what happens, or hey, you want to go to Mexico and see what happens, or my kid's a pimp. Um, there's a lot of ways you can be directly and indirectly connected to sex trafficking or sex exploitation, and unfortunately, um, it's everywhere, and if you haven't interacted it now, you will at some point, and you have a decision to make whether you want to pass along that phone number like I did, or, or let your neighbor know or your how disappointed you are in their actions because I before this class probably would have said oh wow well have fun I mean to each his own that's your decision but I felt um, compelled to say that is disgusting and you let me down as a person and whether it was my right to say that or not I feel like if it put any kind of thought in his head that maybe the idea of going to a foreign country and finding, seeking out young girls for these type of actions, maybe he'll think twice. And I hope I made some change or effort. And I hope um, with the information that I gave you, how the types of people that are looking for this, that the reasons why, um, I mean, just someone's just lonely and they're willing to take advantage of someone because they're lonely or because they don't feel confident or don't have high self-esteem. They're willing to purchase a human being. That it, the, the, it's just is unfathomable to me. So that is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening and I hope I didn't ramble on too much and I hope you absorb some sort of information. And like I said, next time or if you are ever in a situation where you can step up and say, that's gross, or I can't believe that you would do that, or just anything. Um, I know I focused a lot more on the John and uh, this because I feel like a lot of people focus on the victim, and the victim is extremely important. But I think we need to start spreading the word that the the, the idea that the actions of it it's not okay. It's end the demand so there is no supply. Thank you very much.